Good morning, everybody. It's 1046. I think I'm going to get started. Thank you all for joining the uh, Enteral Nutrition Tract. My name is Cynthia Reddick. I'm going to be your presenter today. And this is our subject. I'm a little bit nervous today. I have a timekeeper. She's fierce. She's my daughter. So if you see me starting to sweat up here, it's because she's going to start holding some signs up to get me moving along. Um, but no, I'm thrilled to be here to talk about one of my favorite subjects. I did a presentation at the Virtual Oli last year that sort of inspired me in a multitude of ways. I was doing presentations talking about different feeding tubes and you know, drainage techniques and things of that nature. And it got me thinking about the consumer experience when it comes to getting a feeding tube placed. And I feel like a, a consumer's feeding tube, who, who's going to have it for the long term, it is, it is something that becomes part of their experience on nutrition support. It's their prosthetic. And that's the language I kept using. And my goal in this is to do a couple of things. I want to empower consumers to take agency in the type of tube that they have placed for the long term and something that meets their needs. But I'm also very familiar with the Oli audience and that there's a mix of clinicians in here as well. And of course, I love speaking to clinicians. I am a clinician. It's one of my favorite things to do is to share the consumer experience with my fellow clinicians that work with, that support tube feeding. And so my goal is to help you fill in the gap for your patients, for your home nutrition support consumers who are on long-term tube feeding because you become advocates. You become the educator to help that patient understand what their options are when they, when they go home with a feeding tube. And what we know is that when patients go through this journey, um, there's a healthcare experience, there's an event, there's a, there's a diagnosis, and then all of a sudden there's a feeding tube. And it could be in 2.8 days that that feeding tube is placed and they're discharged home on it, or it could be a little bit longer journey. But there's not a lot of time to make decisions about the right fit for the long term, because not all feeding tubes that are placed stay for the long term, right? And the, and the clinicians and physicians that are placing these tubes in the very beginning are not making decisions for three years out. They're making decisions for right now. So my goal here is to empower you to take agency in your own feeding tube selection and, like I said, uh, educate clinicians on how to help their patients do that as well. My name is Cynthia Reddick. I'm a registered dietitian and certified nutrition support clinician. I've been working in home care since 1999, passionately supporting patients' experience on tube feeding. At the end of the day, I hope to baptize every clinician in this room to help advocate for patients to have a better experience with their feeding tubes in the long term. My financial disclosures are listed here, my relevant financial disclosures. And what we're going to learn today is I'm going to introduce you to a variety of different feeding tube options that are out there, but I'm going to introduce you in a little bit more intimately to their design, how they're placed, um, and a little bit about the anatomy of that placement. And then ultimately, we'll review best practices that it's going to tee everything up for helping to prevent complications with those feeding tubes so that you have a better experience with that feeding tube. So considerations in feeding tube selection um, are listed here. And so we have to think about what is the functional purpose of that feeding tube? What, what function is it going to serve? Not all feeding tubes are actually used for feeding. So that's something to keep in mind. What are the socioeconomic impacts? What kind of insurance coverage patients have? And at the end of the day, ethical considerations also play a role in that acute care experience in making feeding tube choices. So I apologize for the distortion on these. It's not showing up quite right, so we'll try to go through this a little bit. But what I wanted to introduce you to here is this idea of fringe size in a feeding tube. 
So what you can see here is, is an incremental increase in the French size um, and, and what that variation can look like, but also introduce you to what does this French size mean? What, what is a French, right? So it's actually a measurement. It's, it's a measurement of the outer diameter of a feeding tube, but as clinicians and patients, we're always very concerned with the inner diameter and what can go through that feeding tube. But I'm going to introduce you to the insides of these tubes in a little bit, give you a little bit more perspective on French size, but the French size is a, an outer diameter measurement in millimeters uh, times three. That's the actual calculation. But that inner diameter is not 100% dependent on the actual French size. So sometimes it's impacted by the type of material that that tube is made of and whether, it's a, whether it has a balloon inflation device on the inside as well. And so I'll, I'll walk you through that a little bit. But first, let's talk about gastrostomy tube placement. And I love this image so much because it shows all the important anatomy as it relates to proper tube placement. And I hope that you sort of keep this image in your mind. It's going to show up a couple times throughout this presentation. But this is important to understand. when a, And this is a gastric tube that you're looking at here. There's The most common placement techniques are listed here, and so an endoscopic Lee Place tube is placed by a gastroenterologist in the GI lab. There are radiologists that place feeding tubes, and they place those tubes in interventional radiology. And then sometimes tubes are placed in, in a surgery, in a, in a surgical suite, when a patient is having like an open surgery. So there's, there's several different types of departments in the hospital, and they all have different tubes, and there's different options for those different doctors that are placing those feeding tubes. But the, at, you know, at the end of the day, the way that tube is placed uh, still results in an internal retention device, which is what you're looking at here. This is a balloon, an example of a balloon inter internal retention device, and that's filled with water. And then you have this external bolster here. And this is, for lack of a better term, it's actually a term that I learned from consumers. I'm going to call this a dangler style tube, so just remember that term, dangler style. It's also a standard profile feeding tube is what you're looking at here. But what you'll see is that when that tube is initially placed, this internal retention device is placed up against the internal lining of the stomach, and then it's, that stomach is hoisted up against the abdominal wall here, which is not the normal position of your stomach. Normally it's you know, in over here, but that, that internal bolster helps hoist that internal lining of the stomach up against the abdominal wall. Then the external bolster here provides a little tension, and so then you get to create a stoma tract, and that's what's happening here. This is the stoma tract. And so it's really important in those first six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, doctors do not like to replace feeding tubes because this part is maturing. The stoma tract is maturing, and adhesions are created here, and that's a good thing. So that helps keep the interperitoneal space here from getting any formula or medication or water in here. It's bad when we have those types of liquids in the interperitoneal space. So this concept is really important for you to understand, like what does it look like on the inside? A lot of patients don't know what it looks like on the inside. They just see you know, the dangler on the outside. But this is what's happening, and it provides access. This is your prosthetic. So that action of adhering the internal lining of the stomach to the abdominal wall, affixing it, is called gastropexy. So that gastropexy technique is what helps create a healthy stoma tract and one that makes it safe to feed. So there's several different techniques in which to uh, gastropexy, and one is with tea fasteners. And so some of you may have had a feeding tube or clinicians in the room may have seen patients with these little button-looking things that are either underneath the bolster or out around the outside of the bolster when it's initially placed. And there's this tiny little metal T-bar that's underneath, and that little metal T-bar has a suture that goes up through all those layers of skin and abdominal viscera to the outside, and it helps to compress um, that stoma tract to help create that adhesion so that there's a healthy stoma tract. Another way is sometimes Physicians will suture and just create a suture that goes all the way through this thickness. 
And sometimes they'll suture it through a bolster, or if there's no external bolster, they'll just suture it to the skin. And what that's doing is helping to create that safe stoma tract environment while it's healing and creating those adhesions. And then this is just a simple bumper bolster combination where you just have the internal and the external bolster, and they you know, are advising you to make sure that that bolster stays put for um, a good period of time. So now we're gonna talk about uh, common feeding tube types that you see in long term. So we're gonna talk about gastric tubes first. And so this is the standard profile gastrostomy tube, what I referred to as a dangler. So that's my uh, affectionate term for it because that's pretty much what it does is it dangles. And this feeding tube has the soft pliable, there's not a balloon here. So you can see the soft pliable internal retention device at the end is the feeding port. You've got a feeding port here and a little med port here. Here's your little clamp, and then this is the external bolster. And this is what it looks like when it's all disassembled. So when this feeding tube is first placed, you've got this piece that's placed endoscopically. So this is placed by a GI physician in endoscopy, and this feeding tube is placed from the inside out. And it's usually you know three, four feet long, and then it gets cut down. And I was talking to a consumer yesterday who was explaining that when he first had his feeding tube placed, he had this two foot long section of feeding tube hanging off when he first had his feeding tube placed. That wasn't super convenient for his lifestyle, but it's something that we see commonly. But understanding that these peg tubes can be cut down and then put back together to size right for the patient. But the physician who's placing the tube doesn't generally know what that patient's lifestyle is gonna be like at home when they go home. So they are just doing sort of a standard procedure that is like a one size fits all, but it doesn't always fit all. So this is an example of, and gives you a look inside what that standard profile peg tube looks like. And you can see the internal lumen here is a 20 French Here's a 24 French. Both of these are out of the same material, so they have the same sort of thickness here. But you can see the difference in size, and so it's just something that I wanted to share with you so you could get a look at what that, uh, what that looks like. And then this is a different type of dangler. So this is your, a balloon gastrostomy tube. So instead of having that soft internal retention, that little soft um, bolster, you have the balloon that I referenced. And this is filled with water, not air, so make sure you understand that. This should always be filled with water if you have a balloon gastrostomy. This is connected, Every, nothing comes apart here. The tube comes all assembled in this way and none of this part doesn't pop off, this part can't slide off. It's, um, it's placed from the outside in and it's often placed in interventional radiology. And these tubes can be used as replacement tubes after a PEG tube has been placed. Like the prior tube I showed you, this could be used as a replacement tube because it can be replaced in clinic by a skilled clinician. So now I want to introduce you to the inner workings of those balloon gastrostomy tubes because I think this is really interesting. So here's another example of a balloon gastrostomy tube. This is a feeding port. This is an extra feeding or medication port. And you can see that these two ports feed down into the same lumen here. And this is what feeds down into the stomach. And then this port here, this is your balloon port. So when you're looking at a feeding tube from the outside, if you have this extra balloon port, then you know you have a balloon gastrostomy tube. And this tiny little lumen right here, you can see it a little clearer here, is what feeds, air, um, not air, it feeds water down into that balloon, the internal retention device. Oops, wrong way. And so on the inside, just comparing a balloon gastrostomy tube this is your balloon gastrostomy tube. This is that peg style dangler that I showed you. They're both 24 French, so they have the same outer diameter, but what you can see here is that balloon gastrostomy tube has a little curvature here, and a little bit of that internal lumen is taken up by that balloon, um, uh, that balloon port and lumen.
So this view, I want to show you uh, the, what the differences are of internal retention devices. So here's your balloon gastrostomy tube. This is what it looks like on the inside. This tube happens to be a balloon that holds 20 milliliters of water, so it's a little bit larger than, than many, but it does show you what that balloon internal retention device looks like compared to the soft um, peg style feeding tube. And the openings here too, this is what is um, delivering the nutrition. So your formula comes out through these little openings. So a gastrojejunostomy tube, there, some people in here may have a need for gastric access as well as jejunal access. And this feeding tube provides both access through one single tube so or one single stoma tract. So this feeding tube, these are both GJ tubes, but they're, they're different. This one's a balloon style. This one has that soft internal retention device. And so you can see that this G tube port feeds down here and would deliver or suction out of this section. And anatomically, if you think about this sitting on the inside lining of the stomach, it helps you understand how the feeding tube, when you're just looking at a tube, how it actually works. So this would be sitting on the inside lining of the stomach, and if you needed to drain or suction out of the stomach, it would come out of this port here, the G tube port. But then there's this J tube section that feeds through the G and de would deliver nutrition down into the jejunum. And so what comes, what you feed through this J tube port comes out down here. And this is basically the same format, it's just a little bit different style. You can't see the opening like you can in here. So you've got your, um, I, can't, I think that's the G. You've got a G and a J2 port and then this extra balloon port. So again, your balloon port is gonna inflate this section. What goes through gastric is going to come out little openings right here or suction out of little openings right here which is giving you access to the stomach and then the jejunal feeding port delivers nutrition out the very end. There's little holes in the tube right here. So that's how you would bypass the stomach and feed into the jejunum with this feeding tube. And some people have low profile gastrostomy tubes. Sometimes we call these buttons. So this is an example of a button that is a non-balloon style. So it's got a soft internal retention device there. When it's time to feed, you just plug in your extension sets and you can feed the extension sets plug right in here. But when you're not using that feeding tube, this low profile device gives you a really nice option for discretion. And so you're gonna get a chance during the, the round table sessions later today, you're gonna get a chance to get a closer look at the difference between dangler style or standard profile tubes and low profile buttons. So I invite you to check out Kara's table where she's gonna be showing those differences. But again, this is your non-balloon button style. And then this is your balloon style button, which is probably the more commonly placed feeding tube that we see as buttons. So you've got your balloon port here and that inflates this balloon internal retention device there. And when again, when it's time to feed, you just pop that open and you put in your extension sets and you can get a hands-on closer look at that during the round table sessions today. And I love this shot because it shows some variation in options. There are so many options out there for low profile devices. And um, just because you had one kind placed for you know, your initial or secondary placement, you as the owner of your prosthetic have some agency and you can some, make some decisions or make some requests about maybe a different option that suits you better. The important thing to know about low profile devices is that unlike the dangler style tubes, which are adjustable with that um, external bolster, you can adjust the size of that. It's kind of a one size fits all that way. The low profile devices have to be sized and fitted properly. And the most common problem I see as it relates to complications with low profile devices is that it's just a, not a properly fitting button. And um, so that's a really important part of it. When you have balloon style buttons, you can have a little bit of adjustment size wise just by changing the inflation. Like if you were to inflate this balloon a little bit more, it would fit a little snugger. 
Um, but you can't do that with these non-balloon styles, so keep that in mind when you're making decisions about low-profile devices. So this is a little snippet. Now that you've learned about the different components, sort of the anatomy, not only of the placement of the tube, but now you know the anatomy of these feeding tubes, you can figure out what kind of feeding tube you have just by looking at the port on your feeding tube. So for the clinicians in the room who are managing tube fed patients and making assessments, I want to see you looking at your patient's feeding tube and identifying, you can tell just by looking at the outside what kind of a tube it is. So if you see this, because we don't have the privilege of being able to see inside, right? So we're not exactly sure. We don't always have access to that tube, tube placement procedure report right away, but you can get a sense of it. So this is your danglers, right? So if you've got that balloon port here, then you know you have a balloon internal retention device. You know you have something to manage here because that balloon inflation matters as it relates to the long-term health of that feeding tube and also any complications that may occur. So again, this peg tube does not have a balloon port. So you know it's got something else on the inside keeping it in place. And then the same is true with your low profile devices. There's your balloon port. This one has no balloon port. And all these references are from a paper that I published um, when I got inspired about this idea of patients taking agency and, and deciding what sort of device fits their lifestyle, but also it was written for the clinicians that care for these patients to empower them to advocate for their patients. Um, the reference to that paper is listed there, but I wrangled together some of my fellow feeding tube nerds in the home care community. One of them's in this room, Kara. She'll be um, managing the table that's going to basically be showing the difference between balloon or balloon style, non-balloon style, low profile device and dangler style tubes. But that's where this reference is from, so um, you can have access to it there. So this is a case example of somebody who has two feeding tubes, two stoma tracks, two access points. So I showed you a picture of that GJ tube that has access to both gastric and jejunal with one stoma, but sometimes patients have two stomas. You've probably encountered those. You may be sitting in this room right now where you have, uh, this is a G tube, gastric access. This is a J tube with jejunal access. And there's two different kinds of tubes here. So in this G port, there's a dangler style gastric tube. The purpose for this G-tube is drainage and venting, and she prefers a dangler-style tube for that. So she has chosen a dangler-style balloon gastrostomy tube in order to vent. She has better success with that dangler and draining, so that's why she has that there. She test drove a button in there, and it didn't work for her. So that is her access here. And then here she's got for feeding the J-tube a low-profile device. This is, in fact, a gastric feeding tube, but it's placed jejunally, and we do see that from time to time. So it's important to understand that it's a G-tube, but it's being used jejunally. And she has pump feeds in her jejunum, so she has a right angle extension set plugged in there. But she has designed her access devices to meet her needs and the functions that those stomas are, are serving for her. So now I've laid the groundwork for how these tubes work, how they're designed, how they should be properly fitted, and we'll kind of go back and reference some of that as we go through some tube site complications. These are the most common things I see in home care. It's what I see plaguing patients um, over the years, so I hope to impart to you some strategies to help your patients and help yourself as it relates to um, preventing some of them. So when we're assessing tolerance in tube feeding, as dietitians, we do this all the time. We're checking for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, right? Digestive tolerance. But I'm a little more passionate about this tube-related tolerance because I know that if my patients are having a better experience with their feeding tubes, they have a better relationship with their feeding tube, they're more likely to be compliant with that feeding. So it's, uh, that's what we're going to dive into now. Wow, this looks really awesome. Sorry about this. <laughs> 
You can, your brains can fill in the gaps here. You can re replace the, the letters where they're supposed to be. But we're going to talk about leakage. We're going to talk about obstruction or clogged tubes. We're going to talk about tube displacement or when tubes fall out. And we're going to talk about stoma complications. All right, so the leaky tube. This is one of the most common complaints I hear. So you can see one with a, a low profile device. You can see a little leak coming out here with a dangler style. It's really important if you have a leaky tube to protect your skin with barrier cream. The things that are leaking out here are not hospitable to skin. It creates redness, irritation, burning, yeast infections. It causes a lot of problems. So first thing you want to do is protect your skin with barrier cream and then begin the process of identifying what is causing this leak, right? So it's often a, a bolster that's not placed properly. If that bolster is set back too far, then you don't have that gastropexy thing happening. You don't have that balloon or internal retention device resting up against the inside lining of the stomach. And so that balloon, if it's pushed away from the stomach lining, can allow fluids to leak out. So make sure that the external bolster and internal bolster are set properly. And then if, it's, if you have a button, make sure that that button is sized right. That's really important. And then balloon inflation matters. So here's an example of a 4 ml fill versus a 5 ml fill. And you can see the difference in shape. So if this is sitting up resting against the inside lining of the stomach, you're more likely to have like what I call a pseudo seal, like it's less likely to have leakage come out. But here you could see how easily it would be for stomach contents to leak out outside of that balloon. The other thing I find is that brand new tubes, often those balloons are kind of sticky and rigid and when you first inflate it, it can be lopsided. So I really recommend people pre-inflate their balloons and massage them and make sure that they're symmetrical because you could see how easily this could lead to a leak as well. And then lastly, you can't see this down here, but this happens, and there's probably some of you in this room right now who are power feeders and like to feed really fast and get it over with. And so I've encountered some patients who were just filling too much into their reservoir. They were filling too much into their stomach, and it was literally leaking for no other reason except that their stomach was too filled with, with fluid whether it was formula, formula and water, et cetera. OK, so clogged tubes. Uh, my, my PSA about clogged tubes is to really make sure that you're flushing appropriately and as a good habit before and after anything that goes through that tube. So I call that a water sandwich. So you want to flush the tube before feedings, after feedings, before and after medication, before and after any food that goes through, and just to help keep that tube clear, what we call patent. And make sure those medications are going through one at a time. And if you have a J tube or a smaller bore tube, flush more frequently. It doesn't mean you have to get up in the middle of the night and do it all through the night like they did in the hospital, but throughout the day, every three hours, just a little push of water through there and make sure that things are flowing nicely. And make sure that you're, if you're using blends, you're using a very high quality blender and that you're blending for extra time uh, to make sure things are going through um, smoothly. But if you do encounter a clogged tube, you can try a little manual massage. If you can see the clog out here, usually they're invisible to us and they're on the inside. But if you do see a clog in there, you can massage it. Use a 60 ml syringe and use this push-pull technique with some warm water. Or if you have a med port, an ancillary port, you can try a smaller syringe. No smaller than 6 ml, but a 6 ml syringe can give you a little extra force and help dislodge maybe what's on the inside. Tube displacement is basically if your tube falls out, maybe that balloon ruptured or it got tugged on or you got up out of the car and forgot that your backpack was sitting on the seat and you started to leave the car but your backpack was still in the car, sometimes that might <laughs> cause a little tug on your tube, but you really want to make sure that you secure that tube and um, extension sets and choose the right tube for your lifestyle. Again, I was talking to a consumer yesterday. I'm scanning the room for him right now, but you know, he's a busy guy. He likes to, he's a woodworker and he's active and he hikes. Um, 
and does all these things. So having a dangler tube is not a really awesome fit for somebody with that active lifestyle, right? If it's just the caregiver that's um, doing the tube feeding at home and the patient is bed bound, well, having a long dangler makes a lot of sense, but maybe not for somebody who's a little more active. So if this feeding tube comes out because of that, some, most of the time you've got to get into the ER, get into clinic and have that replaced as soon as possible. That stoma can close within two hours. So we, you know, if you're skilled at replacing your own tubes, which a lot of you are, my recommendation is to wash that tube off and put it back in and then tape it down and then get in. Um, if you have a backup tube that you can replace, use that backup tube. But if you don't have a backup tube, get in and, and get a new tube replaced. But the, the concern and the scare for clinicians is making sure that that tube is all the way through the stoma tract. The fear is that it's only partially in and then you start feeding into here. That's why everybody's a little tentative and will always tell you to go to the ER because they wanna make sure things go all the way in. And if you try to put a feeding tube through a stoma and it's not the right size or it starts to get irritated, this gets all swollen and then sometimes you can't get the feeding tube through the stoma and it looks and feels like it's closing, but it's getting inflamed if you're, if you're causing that trauma. So just take care of that quickly, but do your best to prevent that dislodgement. Okay, so now we'll talk about the more common complications that I see, and I can dig deeper into this in my round table, so if you wanna talk further about this, I'll go there. Let me check my time, I'm doing okay. Uh, but let's talk about um, yeast, and or let's talk about hypergranulation first. That's probably the most common thing I see, and hypergranulation is also referred to as proud flesh. Um, it's this sort of growth that you might see around the stoma site, and it, can, it it's like, I'll show you different examples at, at my table later if you come see me, but they're like snowflakes. They're all a little bit different. But it's this spongy, highly vascular, um, very uncomfortable mass of tissue that grows. Usually there's a cause, like if a button is too big, in this case this button has a little bit too much movement here, sort of in and out that in and out motion in and, and that's why the external bolster on the long dangler tubes, having that set properly is really important because if this tube slides in and out, in and out microscopically throughout the day, that friction can cause that hypergranulation to grow. And it's not benign. I've, I've had a lot of clinicians tell patients, ah, it's normal, you know, we're used to seeing that and they don't do anything about it. But I have a problem with that because that hypergranulation is an ooey gooey factory. It creates its own, let's use the word ecosystem, shall we? So it creates its own ecosystem of moisture and sometimes people think it's a bacterial infection but really it's just that tissue uh, generating its own goo and then it makes a bunch of moisture and can lead to things like yeast infections. So what do you do? You wanna secure the tube, you wanna make sure the bolster's set properly, make sure your button is the right size you can, I've seen too many tubes being ordered and replaced without an actual measurement. You can, in fact, measure a stoma tract and size a button properly, but it takes some advocacy sometimes. So if you do have hypergranulation, there's a lot of different approaches and techniques, but my preference is to use an over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream very specifically on the hypergranulation only and do that a couple times a day for a couple of weeks and see if that beats it down. And if not, then you can go towards a prescription grade. If it's resistant to that sort of approach, you can move on to silver nitrate, but that's not my favorite first effort because it hurts <laughs> and it burns and it creates this really unpleasant experience for a consumer. So if you can try with a conservative approach and beat it down that way and, and fix the, the underlying cause of that hypergranulation, then I, I feel like that's a better approach. Now yeast infection is another very common thing I see. often see it in combination with hypergranulation. But yeast infection is this erythemic, that's our fancy medical word for red irritated skin, Infl it's inflamed, so this red erythemic skin here, there's little satellite lesions. Yeast infections hurt, they itch, they burn, 
It's very unpleasant for patients. So you need to protect that skin from, there's always leakage. There's always moisture or excessive sweating or something going on that leads to this. So you have to resolve that excessive moisture issue to prevent it from coming back. But you want to protect the skin with barrier cream. You want to get an antifungal topical going on here with a cream or a powder a couple times a day for a couple of weeks and just watch that calm down. And sometimes you can treat that erythema with a hydrocortisone cream to sort of calm down that red irritation. Um, but that, that hydrocortisone cream you really only want to use until that redness goes away. It's not something you want to put on healthy skin. And then bacterial infections are the least common thing I see. This is a really severe one. This is cellulitis, um, but this is from um, a patient who had a feeding tube. This is a jejunal tube. They had a red robin catheter placed as a jejunal tube. You can see the sutures holding it in place there. But this patient, this was so bad, this patient needed systemic antibiotics. And so that was um, the route we went with, with that patient. But we don't know why, what caused this. It, it could have been from placement. It could have been from lack of education on how to clean that tube site. We don't always know what causes bacterial infections. Um, but we do know that uh, they need to be addressed quickly. So this is a, a compulsory slide. It's in all of my presentations. It's actually an Ole ambassador who is usually here, but he showed up at our Newport Beach Ole picnic about, I don't know, six, seven years ago with a brand new tattoo. And so I snapped a picture of it because I love it for so many reasons. So first of all, this do not overfill, this is real, okay? So going back to our power feeder patient population who shall remain nameless in this room, but if you're a power feeder and can, you know, tempted to overfill, you don't wanna overfill your reservoir, so take it easy there. But I love this picture because it's a properly fitting button. Look at that, it fits so nicely. It's got a nice, he has a really nice healthy stoma. It's not red or irritated, so it's really giving you a good example of somebody who has a healthy relationship with their feeding tube as well, and that's what I love about it. He's got a great sense of humor, and he loves to hike, and so his joke is that, you know, you don't want to hike behind him on the trails, so that's his little warning there. So lastly, what I want to do is let you know, so they, uh, Maisie talked about it briefly in her presentation. I think Lisa mentioned it as well. But we had, and I wanted to make sure you guys had awareness of this, is the little feeding tube information card. It's two-sided. Um, and I've got a stack of them on the table right up front over there. There's three little stacks of them. But basically, if you have a feeding tube, you can get your information on here. You can identify what sort of a feeding tube you have. If you don't know, you can go to your clinician and have them help you fill it out. But this could be something that would be really useful if you had to get admitted to the emergency room or you had to have a tube replacement, just so you know and they know where it was placed, what it's made out of, what access device is it, right? Because it may look like a gastric tube, but it might be placed jejunally, <laughs> right? So these are types of things that you might wanna identify on your feeding tube information card. So there's a stack of them over there and I think they're available digitally as well on the Oli website. And I don't think we have too much time here. I have five minutes, I think, for q and I'm actually really impressed with myself. My daughter didn't stand up. She didn't give me any evil eyes. Um, so I have five minutes until Lisa begins her presentation if there's any questions. It's, oh, hey, hi. Um, so I'll start over. My question is, is that when you get a button feeding tube um, and it says 18 French, is that the same size as the hole in the top of the feeding tube where the connector goes in? Like, is the bottom part of the feeding tube that's internal, that French, the same as the hole that is sticking out of the body? 
Yeah, I think there's differences depending on the French size. So I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact, op you're talking about the end fit opening? It doesn't matter whether it's end fit or not, because it's like- Just the you, button through the yeah, valve. the button itself. So right. like, if you're choosing a formula and say you need that formula to go to a specific French size, mm -hmm. do you have to take into account the, the actual feeding tube, the top, where that connector would go, like for a button? Yeah, so your commercially prepared formulas, I think the only exception would be with blenderized formulas, might have issues with that, but the standard commercially prepared formulas that do not have whole blended food in them go through, so you don't have to be concerned about what size French your tube is or what size the opening of the, of the button and even the connector to the extension set, so like a right angle extension set has a turn as well. But I don't know the exact sizes of those off the top of my head, unfortunately. But it's not something that you have to calculate your tube and then figure out which formula fits through there. If it's a commercially prepared formula, it will go through. Got it. Yeah. Because that hole, that hole is smaller than no matter what size French it is. I like don't... that's kind of the general question, not the actual size, but yeah. is that hole smaller than the actual French of the tube? I don't know the answer to that, yeah, off the top of my head. It's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> Stumped. Um, I have another quick question. Uh, what percentage of people actually get infections from these uh, feeding tubes? Yeah, so the literature has a varied reporting. It's like, I think the literature says a range between 3 and 18% of patients. My personal experience, my personal opinion, this is Cynthia Reddick's opinion, is that that incidence is probably higher than that 3 to 18%, just from my observations, at some point in some time. And when I say infection, I don't mean just bacterial. I think bacterial infections are the least common. I think yeast infections are more prevalent. But I don't have uh, research um, that backs that up because when the research refers to infections as a whole category as opposed to discerning between the two. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm making run. Uh, so the question is, so uh, as a clinical provider, if a patient dislodges their tube and they present to the ED, is there a general census on, is it a time frame or just a clinical comfort level on if it's an ED provider or if we have to call in gastro and they have to take them to endo to replace the tube? So uh, emergency will try to put the tube in and they're gonna put in whatever they have there. So if a patient brings in a tube, they may or may not use that tube, they'll use what they have. And they'll assess the stoma site for any swelling or obstruction, but if they can feed the tube in, then they'll do that. If and then they'll verify that it's gone all the way through, either through x-ray or through assaltation or a flush of water. Um, but if they're not able to get it through in just what we would call bedside, then they, yeah, they would go into procedure to have that done. Mm -hmm. And there's probably people in this room that have experienced that. I think we're at time. She just flashed me my time card. Thank you, everybody.